It's a widespread problem. Surgeons write 28 million prescriptions for opioids each year. The majority of patients who end up in addiction clinics who say that they started with a surgical encounter, that should be on us. An estimated 53 million people used opioids in 2017. 72,000 Americans dying of overdoses last year. I mean, we lost 50,000 in 12 years of war in Vietnam. The most recent data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2017 show that more than 70,000 Americans have died from overdoses. And the widespread use of those pills is growing around the world as well. Would you let a first or second grader or any child use medical marijuana? Some family members in Oregon say yes. Seven-year-old Michaela Comstock has an aggressive form of leukemia. We went from being asleep most of the time on fentanyl and, and uh, morphine to being uh, alert and being able to communicate. Nolan Sousley, battling stage four pancreatic cancer, told officers he had just taken a cannabis pill to ease his pain, but did not have any marijuana, which is what they were looking for. Pain management's a complex issue that's only gonna get more complex over the next couple of years. The pendulum has certainly swung from giving as much opiates as possible to relieve suffering to a sense of responsibility of not creating addicts in the patients that we treat. So now we have this opioid epidemic and now it's starting to swing the other way where there's this pressure on don't overtreat, don't overtreat. And it's a struggle then with our patients with cancer because now some of them, there's these obstacles in place because of this epidemic that we have and issues that folks have, where it's putting obstacles for our cancer patients to now adequately treat their pain, almost swinging the pendulum back the other way, at least with patients with cancer. When it comes to pain management, I think understanding what pain is, is important before figuring out how we're gonna treat it. Pain in patients with cancer comes from several different areas, from the cancer itself, depending on where that cancer is located. Can also be the treatment that we're giving that often can cause pain in a variety of manners. Opioids are morphine, oxycodone, hydromorphone, fentanyl. We have pain receptors in our brain and those receive that sensory impulse. If you cut your finger, that sends an impulse into your body, up into your brain that says, that hurts. And the opioids then can help block. What they do is they block that sensation of pain. They don't. Your body is technically still feeling, still having that pain, but is blocking the sensation of that pain, and that's how they work. With any patient, it's always about setting their goals of care. So for a patient who is in pain, it is what is important to you, what is your goal of care? Is it important that your awake, able to participate with your family and in family discussions. And if it is, then we need to balance your pain with being able to be very awake and very lucid. After I was diagnosed in my bones, I started having some bone pain, especially after the immunotherapy kicked in. And there would be days where I just didn't want to get out of bed or I would feel really nauseous or I would have a lot of pain in my hips and legs. And I used to take opioids. I didn't like how they made me feel, and I didn't want to get addicted. So lucky for us, we live in California, and weed is legal. My family was pretty against it at first, and then I started smoking, using a vape pen, and uh, the combination of THC and CBD really helped me. And my family really got on board after they saw what it did for me. When it comes to those that have been diagnosed with cancer or are fighting it for the second and third time, um, cannabis has actually become quite a blessing. It helps with their uh, nausea. Uh, it does help with the sleep, it does help with the uh, food factor and appetite, uh, things of that nature. It is very um, easy on the system. They um, won't have 
some of the nasty, terrible side effects that come with the chemo treatment. Our body has actually an endocannabinoid system. So again, like we have opioid mu receptors in our body, we have this ECS or endocannabinoid system in our bodies. So we have two, recept two main receptors uh, that cannabis works at works at several others, but the main two are um, cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2. You'll often see as CB1 and CB2. They are in our brain, they are in our nervous system, they're in our gut, they're in several different areas. And so when you use a cannabis product, um, they bind, whether it's THC or CBD, they have different potency for which they bind to the various receptors in the body. Um, Sometimes it's more for CB1, CB2, depends on the product. But they bind to those receptors, and then that is how you can get an effect depending on where it's binding in your system. In general, for cancer patients who are interested in cannabis, I strongly recommend against products that are inhaled, and I have a couple reasons for that. Uh, one area is I work in breast cancer patients. There is data now that the marijuana smoke condensate, or MSC, is estrogenic. Our breast cancer patients Majority of them have hormone receptor positive disease, meaning anything that is pro-estrogen, we don't want them to have because it could have their disease grow. So the edible products for cannabis do not have that estrogenic component. It's really the act of smoking it, whether it's, and I don't care if it's vaporizing, um, whatever, I don't want them smoking it because of that condensate in breast cancer patients. Additionally, we see um, other effects. I have had patients actually have a fungal pneumonia um, from the from smoking it, that inhalation. Um, most of the practices of preparing that product for inhalation does not get rid of the fungal spores. Fungal spores are normal. They are in our soil, they're on our plants, it's a very normal part of it. But when you have a cancer patient who may have their immune system compromised and now they are inhaling a fungal component directly into their lungs, it can cause a severe fungal pneumonia. It's not an issue when you eat it. So if there's fungus on it and you eat it, that's not a big deal. Your gut can handle that. It does not seed to the rest of the body to cause you know, a fungal infection in general. Um, so for majority of our patients eating something, you don't have to worry about it as much as you do smoking. The data and the research has really started to uptake exponentially, I would say, within the past couple of years. If you just look, there's thousands of, of articles now. Even if you are totally against cannabis, I think maintaining an open mind as these studies come out, I don't think it's gonna be the end all to be all. Um, I think it's just another tool that we can potentially use for patients. Certainly in this day and era with medical marijuana being in the forefront of the news, that is, a, it appears to be a healthy alternative or a complementary. Uh, adjunct to the traditional opioid uh, regimens that we give. And there are many patients that have anecdotal, great response to various forms of medical marijuana. The later generation, um, not many people want to smoke, especially if they're not smokers to begin with. So edibles are extremely popular. If it works for somebody, who am I or anyone else to say you can't use it? Especially a cancer patient. If you have a loved one that maybe is dying or is severely sick, I think if you were against cannabis before and you really did your homework, I think you would change your mind. I did the opioid routes through the hospital. I've done morphine shots. I have done Norco. I have done quite a few different things and it seemed that it made it worse so I decided to start my own route with the cannabis and the different uh, oils and edibles and it seemed the natural way to go was a lot better. <laughs>